Amen. So uh, this morning's message, uh, I would say, is really a, a fundamental doctrine um, that uh, I wanted to touch on. I'll start off with the title. The title of this morning's message is Misunderstandings About Hell. Misunderstandings About Hell. And the, uh, part of the reason how this, uh, this message came, uh, uh, came to me is because over the past few years, done a lot of soul winning. And if you been so in any amount of time, you'll know that you get all type of answers when you get to the doctrine of hell, when you're given a good presentation and a good presentation about the gospel must include the doctrine of hell. And it's usually when you get there, you get different types of belief systems and everything like that. And then it's not too long before you find out that people just have a misunderstanding about hell. They've been taught wrong and they believe wrong. And, you know, uh, Today's points pretty much all come from things that I've heard over the past few years. And it was interesting how that everything that I received from that person who would have their teaching about hell, the Bible actually contradicted that. And that's how I was able to come up with today's points and everything. But I want to jump right in um, uh, with the first point. Number one's point today is we're going to deal with the creation of hell, the creation of hell, because you know, this is a misunderstanding that people have. And one of the, the misunderstandings about this is that people always ask the question, well, would a loving God create such a place? Would a loving God create a place called hell? And the reason why is because normally people have an already preconceived idea of what they think God is like. They have made up their mind that God is just this all just loving God who never gets angry. He's never wrathful. And they basically draw their own conclusions and they make up their own ideas of what God is like, how they think he is and everything like that. But their ideas does not line up with what the word of God says. And the truth is, when it uh, when it comes to hell, when it comes to the creation of hell, is that cre the, the creation of hell was created by Jesus Christ himself. OK, let's turn to the Gospel of John, chapter one. The Gospel of John, chapter one. And while you turn there, I'm going to quote um, Revelation, chapter 19. And actually, you know what? I'm going to do something different. Actually, go to uh, Gospel of John chapter 1, and then I'm going to read that revelation right after. But Gospel of John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Correct? So exactly. Notice that it says, In the beginning was the Word. Right? So the good question is, well, who is the Word? Right. Well, I'm going to quote Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. The Bible says, and I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. This is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, how in the end times he's coming for war. He's coming to prepare for war. And verse 11 says, and I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. So isn't that similar to what we just read in the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Correct. So the remainder of that, uh, the following verses say there, I'm going to get over there. <laughs> uh, it says all things were made by him. Right. Exactly. So uh, it says the same verse two says the same was in the beginning with God. Well, who is the same? Well, the context is the word. It says Jesus Christ. The same was in the beginning with God. And here's the key words. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So we see the key words in verse three is all things were made by him. Let's go to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one, where we pick up in uh, verse 14, this is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you know? We well, listen to the words in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So we got a lot of key words in these verses right here, right? The same context here is the same context, or you can say is very similar to what we just read in the Gospel of John where it says all things were created by him. It was created by the word and the word is the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the key words in here. In verse 16, for by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. So when we go into the creation of hell, let's just ask a very, you know, uh, just generic question. Is hell a visible place right now? No. So it is invisible. So Christ still gets the credit for this because the Bible just said and all things it said visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things. There it is again, were created by him. So not only do you get the sun, moon, stars and things that people can just praise like, oh, you know, right here and, and the sun is here and the oceans and the mountains. Yeah, those things are visible. But what about the things that are invisible as well? The Lord Jesus Christ also is the creator of this fiery place called hell. And notice another thing about the scripture. It said all things visible and invisible. Notice the end of it. All things were created by him and for him. So hell was created by Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ. If that makes sense. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. And you say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean it was created by him for him? Yeah. Hell was created to basically carry out the wrath of God upon his enemies. It was created for his pleasure. The wrath of God is upon those who reject him. Um, if you turn to uh, you in Matthew chapter 25, I'm going to quote Jude. It's only one book, Jude. <laughs> Jude, verse 5. The Bible says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So notice what he said about the angels. He said these angels kept not their first estate. Well, what's an estate? Well, he actually says it again right after that, but left their own habitation. And the state is what? Talking about a dwelling place. Where was the angels dwelling place? In heaven. But they did not keep that uh, their first estate, but left their own habitation. So you see that these angels, they have rebelled against God, right? They stood up against God. And you say, well, how does that have to deal with hell or anything? Well, if you're there in the uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew, chapter 25. Let's look at uh, verse verse 40 and 41 the bible says and the king shall answer and say unto them verily i say unto you inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me here's a key verse then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire key words prepared for the devil and his angels so why was cre hell created notice he just said prepared for the devil and his angels. It is reserved. It is prepared. They, has a, they have a reservation and it's for hell. It was created for them. Now, any person will say, especially if you are so, and if you explain this, well, why do humans go there then? If it was created and prepared for the angels, why do human beings go there? A lot of people say this. I'm not mad at this. I, I can agree with it where they say, well, you actually send yourself to hell when you have rejected God and everything like that. But really, it's pretty much very similar to how the angels went about it with their rejection of God. The reason a person go to hell is because of their rejection of Christ, because they refuse to receive that forgiveness of their sins. And because of that, ultimately, they end up just being the enemies of God. 
And God deal with them the same way he's going to deal with Satan and his angels because they're the enemies of God. So that's why a human being will end up in the same place where Satan will be because of their total rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these uh, angels, these devils, hell was created for them. It was created by Christ for Christ to basically carry out his wrath upon them. Notice something that the angels said, not the angels, these demons said, and behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They already know that they have a place prepared for them in hell. They said, have you come to torment us before the time? Hell was created by Christ for Christ as a punishment for his adversaries. So we see, number one, the creation of hell. But then, number two, the location of hell. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. You know, the scriptures is, is quite clear when it comes to the location of hell. And, and sadly, as fundamental as you can sit here and listen to this, this sermon and say, man, this is really fundamental. You would think everybody get it. Not everybody gets it, especially if you've been out. So, so in any amount of time, you'll know that people come up with all type of doctrines and believe different things. But there's tons of scriptures that consistently just give the location of hell. Matthew chapter 12 uh, the Pharisees, let me bring you up to speed. The Pharisees, they basically want to see a sign. Uh, they have this thing that if we see enough signs, we'll believe. Well, anybody read their Bible know that eventually they never believe. You know, they, they never come to that point of placing their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're asking for a sign. They're asking for a miracle. He has done many miracles already. And they just say, hey, just, just show us one more. Like that's going to change anything. But look at verse 38. The Bible says, then certain other scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of of the earth. So notice that Jesus Christ is given a location. He just said in the heart of the earth. And you know, the heart of anything, if you think about it, the heart of anything is hidden. It, it, you don't just wear a heart on your sleeve. We, we don't have our heart on our head or on our forehead, or on our you know, biceps or anything like that. It is not seen, it's hidden. You know, in order to get to this human heart, you got to go through skin. You have to go through bone. You have to go through tissue and cartilage, all type of things in order to get down to the center of the man's heart because it's hidden. And anything that has a heart of it is going to be hidden. It's not going to be seen. And it's just interesting that Jesus says hell is in the heart of the earth. Somebody would say, well, that scripture there didn't say he didn't say hell. Jesus says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so the son of man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So where do you get hell from? He just said the heart of the earth. Well, when you compare scripture uh, upon scripture and you know what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ after his death and when he was buried, you will know that his body descended into hell for three days and three nights. As the Bible say, he seen this. This is speaking about David. He seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. So when you compare the scripture here, it's clearly talking about Jesus talking about the heart of the earth is hell. And that's what he descended to for three days and three nights. Christ said that hell is in the heart. It is in the uh, is beneath the earth. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 32. Ezekiel chapter 32. And 
And while you turn there, um, I'm going to quote uh, some other scripture that actually gives hell specific location as well. The way of life, excuse me, Proverbs 15, 24. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Isaiah 14, 12, talking about Satan and his fall. Uh, he's Lucifer at that time. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did is weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud, of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Uh, Numbers chapter 16, you all know that story uh, with uh, Korah and his men. And actually, you know what, for time's sake, I'm gonna skip that one uh, because I'm gonna touch it a little bit later, but we know that uh, when they stood against Moses, the Lord clave open the earth and they descended into the pit. The Bible said they descended there alive into the pit, so they went down. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 32, and I will recommend on your own time, Ezekiel chapter 32, um, I'm picking up on the latter end of it because this starts in chapter 29 and it spans over four, four chapters or so, four or five chapters or so. And what happens is it's just one long prophecy to Pharaoh in Egypt. And it's because of their, their pride, it's because of you know, their rejection against God and, and worshiping idols. So I will recommend starting at chapter 29, but I'm going to pick up in chapter 32. And uh, chapter 32 here, let's pick up at verse 17. The Bible says, It came to pass also in the twelfth year, in the fifteenth day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, well for the multitude of Egypt, and cast them down, even her, and the daughters of the famous nations, unto the nether parts of the earth. Now, first of all, that word nether, we're going to see this come up over and over. And just a basic definition is talking about being situated beneath. That's what nether is, being situated below or beneath. So this word is going to come up a few times. So he says in the middle of that verse, unto the nether parts of the earth with them that go down into the pit. And the thing is, with this Ezekiel, there is a, a lot of uh, symbolism as well that goes beyond just a prophecy just to Pharaoh. There's more other things that uh, go on and symbolisms that I'm, I'm not going to you know, chase right now. But nine, verse 19 says, Whom dost thou pass in beauty? Go down and be thou laid with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down. They lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Now, with these next few verses, pretty much to the end of what we're about to read, the Lord is going to be talking about all these different nations that are joining Pharaoh in hell. And he's basically saying, you're not going to be there alone. All these other nations who rejected me, they're going to be your company down there. So verse 22 says, Asher is there and all her company. His graves are about him. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the sides of the pit, and her company is round about her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, which caused terror in the land of the living. There is Elam and all her multitude round about her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down uncircumcised into where? The nether parts of the earth, which caused their terror in the land of the living. Yet they have borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. They have set her a bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though their terror was caused in the land of the living, yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. He is put in the midst of them that be slain. There is Meshach, Tubal, and all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they cause their terror in the land of the living. And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are going down to hell with their weapons of war. And they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities shall be upon their bones, though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yea, thou shalt be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised and shall lie with them that are slain with the sword. There is Edom, her kings and all her princes 
with which with their might are laid by them that were slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised and with them that go down to the pit. There be the princes of the north, all of them, and all the Zidonians, which are gone down with the slain, with, the, with their terror. They are ashamed of their might, and they lie uncircumcised with them, that be slain by the sword and bear their shame with them that go down to the pit. Pharaoh shall see them and shall be comforted over all his multitude, even Pharaoh and all his army, Slain by the sword, saith the Lord God. Uh, may as well finish verse 32. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living. And he shall be laid in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain with the sword. Even Pharaoh and all his multitudes, saith the Lord God. So verse 33, as I see, as we said there, Pharaoh is going to be coming. He's not going to be there alone is what the Lord is saying. He said all these other nations who are uncircumcised talking about their rejection against him. These are just unsaved. He's talking about, listen, their rejection because of that. He said they're going to go down. How many times did we see nether parts down the pit? It's over and over where we see the location of hell. And you may sit here and you say, well, I know this. Well, the thing is, not everybody knows this. Go out soul winning for a long, uh, for a great amount of time. And what do you hear? Oh, hell is right here on earth. Hell is right here on earth. I, I'm, we living in hell right now. You see all these mass shootings? Oh, man, hell, I heard this one. Hell is a state. It's a state of mind. I, I, and, and the thing is, I don't want to belabor the point, but I wanted to go through Ezekiel where he's constantly saying down to, to the pit. It's in the nether parts. Jesus says in the heart of the earth. And what is the doctrine of today? We're living in hell right now. This is hell right now. That's that's a that's a deception. I missed a part of the Bible where, you know, hell had, you know, fancy cars and four hundred thousand dollar houses and, you know, vacation spots in and great big cities. And I miss all that part right there. This is not hell. We are not living in hell. And we're going to get to Luke chapter 16. And what we live in now is paradise compared to what he's uh, describing in Luke chapter 16. So we see the creation of hell, the location of hell, but then the literal fire of hell. Let's turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, going to deal with the literal fire of hell, because this is a biggie right here, right? Is hell really a literal fire? Whether it's literal or symbolic, that's the argument right there. And often when you hear somebody just say hell is symbolic, I just literally dealt with someone recently about this. Hell is just symbolic. I like to ask the question, what is this symbolic of? What is this symbolic of? Because this guy is burning in hell. He say I'm tormented in these flames. And you say it's symbolic. Well, actually, I'll go with that. It's symbolic. What is this symbolic of then? You know why you normally get? Go to JW.org. Go to JW.org. You'll find it out. That's what you usually get when you get asked that question. What is it symbolic of? Go to JW.org. That's all I have to say. Well, I went to JW.org. And JW.org, they have this section on there. And for those, JW.org is Jehovah's Witness.org. OK, uh, so they have a section on there that starts out as saying about us. And you just click away. I'm like, I know it's on here somewhere. It got to be on here about hell and everything. So it, it titled it the section of did the Jehovah's Witnesses change the Bible to fit that idea? That was the title of it. And of course, they said no. And I'm like, oh, come on now. Like, you know, so you click away and they have this uh, article that says, what is hell? Is it a place of torment? Excuse me. Is it a place of eternal torment? And it has a question mark behind it. It started out saying some Bible translations use the word hell for the Hebrew word Sheol and the matching Greek word Hades, both of which refer to the common graves of mankind. Many people believe in a fiery hell as shown in this religious artwork. They have a piece of artwork that someone worked up of their imagination as to how they think hell is. 
uh, as shown in this religious artwork accompanying this article. However, the Bible teaches otherwise. So they're saying the Bible does not teach a literal fiery hell is what the article is saying. So they have five points and I'll just I'll just list them off. Um, number one, they say those in hell are unconscious and so cannot feel pain. Well, we started out reading Brother Bruce read Luke 16 in its entirety, right? So there's their first one. Those in hell are unconscious and so cannot feel pain. There, and they have an explanation behind it. There is no work, nor devising, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. That was Ecclesiastes 9, verse, verse 10. Of course they changed it. Good people, number two, good people go to hell. That's literally what it says. Good people go to hell. I'm like, you can check this afterward, okay? If you guys think I'm joking. Good people go to hell. Now, remember how I started out reading the article? It says that hell is the grave. That's what they consider the grave. So to them, hell is equivalent to the grave. So they say good people go to hell. Well, that's a contradiction because the Bible said there's none that doeth good, no, not one. So they say the faithful men Jacob and, jo uh, Jacob and Job expected to go there. Number three, death, not torment, in a fiery hell is the penalty for sin. I'm going to come back to this one because that's really what I want to touch. Number four, eternal torment would violate God's justice. Number five, God does not even contemplate eternal torment. God does not even contemplate eternal torment. And they have a verse to, they have, you know, 1 John uh, 4, 8, you know, God is love. They use that. But then they took one, they took a verse to actually explain this away. And of course it's butchered. But it says, they, Jeremiah 7, 31, they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the sun of Hinnom, in order to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, something that I had not commanded and that had never even come into my heart. So they use that verse to show that, you know, that is proof that, you know, God would not even contemplate sending one, anyone to hell. Well, let me explain that chapter, chapter seven, where Jeremiah is talking about that. He's talking about how Israel is basically worshiping false gods and their worship of their false gods is to cast their own children into the fire. And in that chapter, God says, listen, that I have not. This is not the type of worship that I asked for. I'm paraphrasing. This is not the type of worship that I asked for. Never has this come into my mind is basically what the Lord is saying. So that is not talking about that God would not send anyone to hell. So I want to explain that because they're they're twisting that scripture right there. OK, but let's go back to that. Number three, death, not torment in a fiery hell is the penalty for sin. And what do they like to use for the wages of sin is death. So basically you want to use that to basically explain away later on the second death, which if you go out soul winning, you normally start with 623 as one of your beginning verses. And then you go to the second death, because if there's a first death, there is a second death as well. But their explanation of this is that it's just. That hell is just the grave, meaning that the penalty for your sin, the wages of sin is death. Meaning that my repayment for my sin is only to go back to the grave. Now, if you really think about this, don't look at me crazy when I, see, when I say this. If you take that approach, that's actually not bad, right? Yeah, because the worst I get for my sin is to just die physically and, and lie in the grave six feet. That's not really bad if you're canceling out hell, right? So I can live it up, I can drink it up, party up, fornicate it up, adultery it up. I can do whatever I want and the worst I'm gonna get is actually just go back to the grave. If you really think about it, that's not so bad, right? Because everybody, matter of fact, when, uh, uh, who is that? Uh, Joshua, if I'm not mistaken, Joshua, who was about to pass, he said, I go the way of all the earth. So guess what? Everybody is gonna go back to the grave. So if I don't have a second death awaiting me, then, why not just, you know, live it up? And that's what they want you to believe that, hey, the worst you're going to get for your sin is just death, just lying in the grave. That's that's not the word of God. That is a total misunderstanding. 
let me quote, uh, you guys turn to Luke chapter 16, I'm going to quote Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. Let's get the truth of the Bible. The Bible says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Hold on, I just thought about this. You know, people just say Jesus never talked about hell. I mean, how, how many verses did we talk about? Matthew 25. All right, I'm going to just keep going because a lot of this is coming from Jesus himself. Matthew 13, 47, uh, verse 48 now, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping, excuse me, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It seemed like Jesus himself just called hell a furnace of fire. It's a literal fire. Luke chapter 16, you're there. Let's go to verse 22. And if you're taking notes, you can just write down Mark 9, 47 through 48, uh, where the Lord says where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That's the famous scripture where he says, um, I'll just quote it. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's a literal fire. Luke 16, where you are, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this what flame. Over and over. And, and whether you want to call this, I believe Luke 16, this is a real story. I don't think this is a parable. I think this is a real story. But even if somebody was to say, well, this is a parable. Well, a good way to, you know, strengthen parables is to go with clear statements. And notice that we started with clear statements first. And then we ended up with, I call it the story, but someone may say the parable. Well, it's still consistent. Christ call it is hellfire, it's a furnace of fire. The man here says, I'm tormenting in this flame. If you believe that hell is not a literal fire, you have a misunderstanding of hell. Number one, we see the creation of hell. Number two, the location of hell. Number three, the literal fire of hell. Number four, the everlasting fire of hell. There's a difference. We have the literal fire that's of hell, but then the everlasting portion of that as well. There's a misunderstanding <clears throat> whether as to whether hell is everlasting or not. Is it a place of annihilation? Uh, is it a place where you just go and you're instantly just burnt up like, you know, you throw a piece of paper in the fire. It only lasts for so long and then it's just devoured. Well, let's start. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go to Leviticus chapter six. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 6 Moses here is giving instructions concerning the priests and how they should go about as to carrying out burnt sacrifices and the Bible says look at chapter 6 Leviticus chapter 6 look at verse 9 command Aaron and his son saying this is the law of the burnt offering it is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning now, what I'm trying to let me explain here why I'm going here, because basically even the Old Testament teaches that hell is everlasting. That's why I'm going here. And this fire here, when the priest would basically set fire to that perfect lamb, it was a basically a, a representation of hell. That's what the fire is. You burn it with fire. You roast it with fire as, as well as the Bible say. So this is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar. Key words all night until the morning and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen breeches 
shall he put upon his flesh and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar. And he shall put them beside the altar and he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. Verse 12 and 13, pay close attention. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Is that not even teaching in the Old Testament in Leviticus? If you want to say it's symbolic, amen. It's symbolic of the real hell. That that fire is ever burning. It never goes out. And I like what he told the priest. He said, it shall not be put out. Every morning, that fire needs to continue to burn and burn. It needs to go on. Remember the energizer burn? It just keeps going and going. You all remember that commercial? The little bass drum going and going. It's the same thing with hell. That's what he's saying. It shall never be put out. It shall never go out. It shall ever be burning. Turn to Luke chapter 16. Keep your finger there, but turn to Revelation 19. If you can just keep your finger in Luke 16. But turn to Revelation 19. <clears throat> now I'm going to quote Matthew 25, 46. Then shall he answer them, saying, this is Jesus again. Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If you're there in Revelation chapter 19, let's look at verse 19. We're proving that hell is everlasting. This is uh, picking up in verse 19. This is speaking about that, that, that false prophet and the beast who basically are working with Satan. We're talking about the end times. And the Bible says in verse 19, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. They basically made war. They're coming to make war against Christ, basically, and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So notice here it says the, the, the beast and the false prophet were cast into this lake of fire. And yes, I'll just go ahead and say now there's a difference between hell and the lake of fire. Hell one day is going to be relocated and uh, is going to be in the lake of fire. OK, so let's uh, with that in mind, look at chapter 20, verse one. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So obviously I heard this talk many years ago, so many times that this is Satan coming down and, and he has a great chain in his hand. Well, I like I always think every time I have it actually written down here in my Bible, the verse where Jesus say, can Satan cast out Satan? Look at the very next verse. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. So if that was Satan in verse one. So is he's casting himself out. Is he chaining himself up? And he laid hold on the dragon. Who is he? The angel of the Lord from verse one. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose a little season. Going to stay in this chapter. I'm going to fast forward. We have the thousand year reign of Christ. Let's look at what happens afterward. This uh, Satan who was bound, who was cast into that bottomless pit. What happens is he's loose now. He goes out to deceive the nations now. And then uh, pick up in verse nine. It says, and they went up on the breath of the earth and compass the camp of the saints about and but and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. 
Basically, he, Satan goes out, he musters up this army, he deceives them, they come out thinking that they can basically beat God. Clearly from there, it's not even a fight. God just sends down fire upon them and just scorch them up. Verse 10 says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet, keyword are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, notice that this happens a thousand years after the beast and the false prophet were cast into this lake of fire. And then after the thousand year reign of Christ, when he comes back out and deceives the nations, Satan is now cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. It didn't say where they were. It didn't say where they used to be or where they were once devoured. It says it's where they are, which means that that's current, which means that for a thousand years, they still been burning. That sounds like it's everlasting. And then just in case you miss that it's everlasting, look in the same verse. Look how it ends. Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night. Keywords forever and ever. Clearly, the Bible teaches, I told you to uh, keep your hand in Luke, right? Luke 16. Clearly, the Bible teaches that hell is everlasting. Luke chapter 16, look at verse 24. This is our main test for today. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, this is the rich, uh, the rich man, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Here's a key verse. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Notice what he said. Lazarus, excuse me, uh, the rich man want Lazarus to come and bring him some water. Dip the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue. Notice what Abraham said in verse 26. There's a great gulf between us so that they which would pass, meaning that those who have a desire, those who want to leave where I am to come to you. He said they cannot. Well, I don't believe in Abraham's bosom. The bosom is a body part. So where is Abraham? Abraham is in heaven. Abraham is saying for those who want to leave heaven, who want to pass from where I am right now to where you are. He said, basically paraphrasing, they cannot. If they wanted to, they cannot. If you had a desire to go to hell, you cannot. On the vice versa end of things, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Those who are in hell, where you at, Mr. Rich Man, you cannot pass from there to here. You're in there forever. If you want to call it a parable, I call it a story. Either way you take it, it's still teaching that it's everlasting, that you cannot get out. Neither you can leave heaven to go to hell, neither can you leave hell to come to heaven. Both places are eternal. If you're thinking that hell is not everlasting, not only a literal fire, but an everlasting fire that is there for eternity, you have a misunderstanding of hell. Not only do we see the creation of hell, the location of hell, the literal fire of hell, the everlasting fire of hell, but number five, the mockery of hell. Turn, are you still there in Luke 16? The mockery of hell. You say, well, why is this a misunderstanding? Because you not only have people who will try to deny hell's existence, but you have people who actually will admit to a hell and they make mockery of it. One of the mockeries I would never forget is um, 
with uh, Pastor uh, Roger Jimenez when he was uh, going through all that Orlando, so all those protests that showed up. And one of the sodomites out there, i never forget, had a sign walking around marching that said, I bet hell is fabulous. That, that's the mark. I, I, I think it's funny that uh, the mockery is that you know the end result for that, of that sin right there. You, you know your destiny for that. I bet hell is going to be fabulous. The mockery that comes along from hell. People want to make hell to be this place of fun, right? I've heard it many times, out soul winning. People want to make it some vacation spot. Oh, you got to go there. You got to try the lobster there. You got to stay here at this place. They, they make hell out to be one of those places. Oh, man, it's a place of fun. Oh, you just got to go there. But it's not so. You in Luke 16, I'll quote Matthew 13, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Here's Jesus again. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. Here's the key words. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. I don't think that sounds fun. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. I don't think that's fun. What is, na uh, what is a wailing? Ah! I probably can't even compare to what people are really wailing like in hell. Because I don't have any flames on me. I'm not being tormented. Gnashing your teeth. Ah! I know it may seem funny, but it's real. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. This, this doesn't seem fun. The one of the first times you see that term wailing, weeping, you actually see it in Esther chapter four. You don't have to turn it if you want to. That's fine. But Esther chapter four, the decree has gone out to kill all the Jews. Haman has sent out, hey, let's kill all the Jews. Mordecai wouldn't worship me. I want to do away with these people. In verse three, the Bible says, and in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting, key words, and weeping and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. These people, only their physical body was going to be destroyed. He, he's not in the context here. This is not talking about these people are going to die and go to hell. This is just a physical body that Haman is promising that he's going to destroy. And the Bible said that they got to fasting and weeping and wailing. Can you imagine just being in that city, just walking down the street and you hear house after house just wailing? That's a difference than crying. <laughs> that's that's a weep, wailing which I just did, which I'm not going to do again. That's wailing. And, and I probably did it wrong. Right, right, right. Right. Luke 16, 23, 25 through 25. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Notice the man himself in hell said, I'm tormented. Abraham confesses and say, you're in torments now. That doesn't sound like a place of fun. And, and this is what I'm talking about with the mockery of hell. I'm not lying. I have I know somebody personally that I tried to give the gospel to when I asked about, hey, you, you know, if you were to die today, you, you know, if you're 100 percent sure you're on your way on your way to heaven. Do you know that you have that assurance? He said, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell. All my friends are in hell. The mockery of hell. All my friends are there. Really? 
Me and my son were out last year sometime, knocked on his uh, guy door, asked this very same question. He laughed. <laughs> I don't want to go to heaven. I, I want to go to hell. He had an accent, a strong accent. So I had to make sure I heard him clear, like, wait a minute. Eh. So I asked you if you were to die today, are you on your way to heaven? You want to go to heaven? No, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to hell. He, I want to go to hell. I got friends there. I'm like, what is this thing? This is the second person who told me I got friends there. The mockery of hell, where people think it's just this ultimate vacation spot. Me and my friends are going to hook up and we're going to have a great time. It's not a place of fun. It's a place of torment. And we see it here. It's a place of weeping. It's a place of, 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 of wailing. It's a place of gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound fun. If you believe and can make a mockery of hell that is just this fun place, you have a misunderstanding of hell. Not only do we see the creation of hell, we see the location of hell, we see the literal fire of hell, we see the everlasting fire of hell, we see the mockery of hell, but then, number six, the inseparability of hell. Turn to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, the inseparability of hell. There's this lie, there's this uh, false doctrine that's taught that says once a person dies and they go to hell, they're eternally separated from God. They're eternally separated. Well, let, let's quote some scripture. Proverbs 15, 11. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Hell and destruction, here's the current tense, are before the Lord. How much more the hearts than the hearts of the children of men? Psalm one nine, uh, Psalm uh, chapter 139, David is making his boast in the Lord. How the fact that the Lord is omnipresent. How the fact that wherever you go, you're going to run into the presence of the Lord. It's inescapable. It's inseparable. David says in verse six and seven in that in that chapter, whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, David, of course, did not go to hell, but he's driving in the point of the Lord's presence that wherever you go, you cannot escape the Lord's presence. Even if you were to physically die, you will still be in the presence of the Lord, whether that's in heaven. If I make my bid in heaven, thou art there. Or if it is in hell, he said, if I make my bid in hell, behold, thou art there. He's basically saying that the presence of the Lord is something that you cannot escape. You say, well, what's the big deal here? Well, because there's many people and I've been taught this as well. And I heard it many times. I guarantee you turn on TBN right now. There's a pastor on there talking about you're going to be eternally separated from hell. You're, you're going to be eternally separated from God. You hear it all the time. You hear it in so many churches. you that hell is eternal separation from God. And it's just a flat out lie. You don't escape the presence of God when you go to hell. You burn, you roast just like those Animals were roasted in uh, in the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ, he suffered for our sins. It was in the presence of the Lord. Guess what? The same thing for that person who has rejected the Lord. You burn in his presence. You roast in his presence. David said, if I make my bed in hell, here's the key words. Behold, thou art there. It's inseparable. Revelation chapter 14 this is talking about people who would this is coming off the uh, the the mark of the beast in chapter 13 and those who would accept the mark of that beast that sits 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 and what happens is is that the lord is basically giving the punishment for those who would accept that mark verse uh, 9 the Bible says, if you're in Revelation 14, verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, here's the key words, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Amen. 
you receive that mark of that beast and clearly you receive that mark. That is a clear rejection of God. That's a clear rejection against Christ. And the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon that person. And listen, they don't just die and go over to the grave and they soul sleep. But no, the Bible says that they're going to be burning in the presence of the lamb. Someone would say, well, you know how people like to contradict, try to build a contradictory in the Bible. Well, if you look at verse 10 at the end, it just it didn't say Jesus. It just said in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. Hmm, it didn't say Jesus. Where's where's Jesus? Ha, I got you right there. Right. You don't have an answer. Well, I like what John said. The Bible said the next day, John talking about John the Baptist, see Jesus coming unto him and says, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Notice what he just called Jesus. The next day, John seeth Jesus. And what did he say unto him, unto him? Those that was following John, he pointed him to Christ and said, behold, the lamb of God. Compare scripture with scripture. This is the lamb. Jesus Christ is the lamb. That person does not become inseparable from God. They burn in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. They roast. They eternally there in the presence of the lamb. That God that you rejected, you know what? You're going to burn his presence. If you really look at it, if you're an atheist or agnostic or just a hater of God, you don't really mind that doctrine of I will be eternally separated from God. You don't mind that doctrine. You're like, well, hey, if I'm an atheist, I didn't believe in him no way. If I'm an agnostic, I knew something was out there. I just didn't know if it was him. If you're a hater of God, I didn't love him anyway. Sign me up for that first ticket where I'm it's separated from God for eternal, for eternally. To be eternally separated from him. Sign me up for that. But no, you have a misunderstanding. When you get the true word of God that no. That God that you hated, that God that you rejected, you're going to burn in his presence. I'm about to close here. We see the creation of hell. These are all misunderstandings. We, we, did, we covered the creation of hell, the location of hell, the literal fire of hell, the everlasting fire of hell, the mockery of hell, the inseparability of hell. But lastly, number seven, the casting into hell. The casting into hell. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. The casting into hell. You say, well, what's the misunderstanding about casting into hell? Well, there's people who say that God will not send anyone to hell. What type of loving God will send someone to hell? Let alone you say that, you know, he created it. Now you're saying he's going to send people there? What type of religion is this? But there's a saying out there that God won't send anyone to hell. But the scriptures clearly teach something different. And, and that's the opposite notion. God wouldn't do that. Well, you're leaning to your own understanding now. God wouldn't do that. Say it who? Show me in the Bible. Well, that's just how I feel. Now, Numbers chapter 16, you don't have to turn there, but prove that God will send people straight to hell. Korah and his men who stood up against Moses. Challenge his leadership and everything. Numbers chapter 16, verse 31. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertain unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertain to them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them and they perished among the congregation. Look like God just sent someone straight to hell. Notice that the Bible said they were sent there alive. Matthew 10, 28. Jesus would never send some God, the father and Jesus. See, God was harsh in the Old Testament. But this Jesus, he's more loving. Matthew 10, 28. Jesus himself and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, which is able to which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. What type of Christ is that? He's destroying people in hell. It's the Jesus of the Bible. It's not another Jesus. 
Matthew 13, 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. And the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And on this one, he's saying he's going to get his angels to cast people into hell. Revelation 20, verse 14. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. <clears throat> and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Well, you know, hell, what, what really constitutes hell and build it up is the people. The people that's there. So when he say that he's casting hell into the lake of fire. No, he, he it's the people that's there. That's being relocated there. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Notice the key words cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I mean, as, as a four letter word, that's a powerful word. He didn't say he's going to put them in the lake of fire. He's going to place them there. I mean, just cast into the lake of fire. Get out of here. He's going to cast. Listen, God is a God of love. God is long suffering. God is patient. God is forgiving. God is merciful. But we need to get a true balance of the God of the Bible that not only is he all that, but he is a God of wrath. He's a God of anger. He gets angry. The plenty of times in the Bible where it says his anger waxed hot. You have a misunderstanding of hell if you think God would not cast someone into hell. Let's close it out. Luke chapter 16, where we started at. Luke chapter 16. You may sit here at this sermon and say, well, I knew all this already. I knew the doctrines. This is nothing new for me. Where do I walk away with it? What can I get out of it? This is fundamental as I started out saying. Well, the main application that we can take from this is to actually honor the requests of the people in hell. Honor the requests of the people in hell. You know, they have a lot of requests. Water. Send Lazarus that he would dip his finger in water. He want water. He wanted to get out. Abraham said, no, you can't pass from 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 fence to here. So they want water. They want to get out. But then the thirdly part, thirdly, they want people to preach to their loved ones. We can honor their requests. People in hell want you to go preach to their to their loved ones. It's in the text. Look at verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, who is the context here, talking about the rich man. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto, that he may preach to, that he may witness to. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. We can honor that request. You want to get an application from this? Honor the request. I, I want somebody to go preach to my loved one. Everybody has someone in their family that you know is not saved. We can honor that request. We may have loved ones who have went on already. And they're probably, if they could talk to us, if they're in hell, they could tell us, listen, go preach to auntie such and such. Preach to uncle such and such. Preach to my mama. Preach to my daddy. So they won't come here to this place of torment. It's a place of torment. We can honor that request. They don't want anybody to come there. Secondly, on the application, you say, well, how do I know it's me that should do that? How do I know if I'm the one that should bring it to auntie such and such and, and uncle such and such? How do I know that I'm that person? Well, look at the text, verse 29. Abraham saith unto him, talking about that, that rich man, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Amen. I had someone try to uh, talk me down of this because I, I always believe and I hold on to this, that this Moses and the prophets is not only just talking about Moses, Jeremiah, Paul, Timothy, Barnabas. It's not just talking about all these preachers, the Lord Jesus Christ. No, it's plural. Prophets. 
It's talking about us. Right. This is not talking about some, you know, Pentecostal where I see the Lord. <laughs> I see the Lord doing this for you right now. <laughs> I see. No, that's not what he's talking about. When he say we're not talking about that. We talk about people who can open up the word of God and expound the doctrine of Christ so someone can get saved. Right. That's what we're talking about when we say when he says they have Moses and the prophets. Amen. It is our responsibility to preach the word of God, to go out and get people saved. We are those prophets. The Bible, it, it, it doesn't just stop with Moses. And, you know, matter of fact, Moses said, I would that all God's people were prophets. It doesn't just stop right here with Moses and Jeremiah and Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ. No, Jesus Christ passed it on to us and said, ye are the light of the world. He said, you go ahead and preach the gospel to every creature. It is necessary. Why? Because many people have a false belief. They have a misunderstanding about hell. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, uh, that we can get the truth about hell from your word, God. We thank you, Lord, um, for just leading us into all truth as your, uh, your son, Jesus Christ, said the Holy Ghost would. I pray, Lord, that we take this message and we take these words and we put them into action, Lord, and that we go out and get our loved ones uh, saved and that you can give us the boldness and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to open up our mouths uh, that we may save our loved ones and just our fellow man, Father, Lord, lest they go to that place of torment, Father. We thank you uh, for truth and we thank you and we love you, Lord God. In Jesus name. Amen.